so by way of introduction, so I'm Gary Bellamy, so I'm Head of Learning Technology. That just happens to be my current role. I've been doing it for about seven years, been in L&D for about 24 years. Uh, so I'm as interested in running learning as a business as in the technology and how it enables it. But I'm going to try and cover a bit of both as we go through. Um, as if you've ever done a presentation and sat on a tube and thought, oh, that's what I was supposed to be talking about. I wonder if my slides meet that. You'll find that out as we go through now. So I'm going to try and meet my objectives if I possibly can. So to the bing, bing. So I titled it that, Continually Improving the Learning Function. I'd love to say and be boastful and say, we've got all the answers. We've been brilliant at this. Uh, but I've not found anyone yet that has got all the answers, but we have got a lot of experience. So if, if, if nothing comes out of this rather than you thinking, ah, oh, they went there, then there, then there, and it wasn't a great idea, then that's a result, I think. But, but we'll see where we go. So things that I want to cover. Bing. There we go. Oh, Jen, it's very formless. It's very good. So I thought we'd try an agenda. We'll go for that. So, uh, and I'm going to mix a few things in this agenda, as you might expect. So the context, useful, I thought, to talk about the context of Lloyd's. Uh, you've probably all heard of Lloyd's, but I'll talk you through some of the uh, changes we've been through. Uh, the transformation focus, so this is partly an update from a transformation that we made. We centralised learning. It was my sixth time of doing it. That is a clue for you there, really, about <laughs> is that the way to go. So, um, so the transformation focus, uh, and uh, that was in 2010 we started thinking about it with integrations of other companies, obviously, which we'll talk about in a moment. 2012, then we had an update here actually and so what I wanted to do then was look at well where have we got to since then have we moved again was the original plan that we went for the one we stuck with and why not okay so that's what I want to cover uh, so 2012 progress mid 2014 progress moving with the business of course because uh, the business won't stand still it keeps moving it has different needs it wants different ways of doing different things and our latest group strategic review, we just finished the three year, I think we called it integration one, I think. We're now in transformation and the latest group strategic review is that the bank will go digital. Not that it might, not that it could, but that it will go digital. And I do fully expect that with L&D, that will have an impact on that because the expectation will change. Okay, so that's where we'll go next. And then, uh, what next? So, you know, we have a few cunning plans for what next. Uh, uh, and then, if we have a bit of time in the end, Q&A. So the context. So Lloyd's Banking Group. Have you ever heard of Lloyd's Banking Group? Well, you might have done. You know how it is. Um, so it's multi-brand. I think you probably knew that. Uh, we have on the high street three different brands. Right? So we have Lloyd's, Bank of Scotland and Halifax from our merger that we, that we went through about three, four years ago. Um, and they are our face to the public, mostly our face to the public. A decision was taken quite a while ago, uh, well then really, that we would keep them as separate brands. Right? They each serve a slightly different audience because people say, oh, they're going to take over the whole high street, but they do serve a different audience. Okay? So Lloyd's, have got in, Lloyd's Bank have somewhere in the order of 2,000 branches, Halifax have around 700, and I think Bank of Scotland is about 400, so quite a big presence on the high street. Um, and of course, behind the scenes, there are subsidiary brands. So Lex Auto Lease, uh, we are a bank, but we're also the biggest leasing company for cars how that works but it sort of how it did and that was a function of coming together with the Halifax and um, because both sides had their own car leasing business so we ended up with the biggest one that's good and it's and it's formed a core part of the of the uh, group um, Black Horse of course you've probably seen Black Horse Finance do a lot of car financing quite neat really that we should have Lex Auto Lease and of course underpinning all of that is Scottish Widows which is our insurance brand okay which are uh, accessed through the branches or online okay uh, as I've said already, the digital presence is there. We have more online banking users than any other bank in Britain, um, and we're perilously close to uh, the number of transactions online exceeding the number of transactions in a physical building. Okay? So whether we like it or not, we're going digital, <laughs> uh, because that's what the customers demand. So you could either sit and say, oh, no, I like going and standing in a That's not really the future. So. So in 2010, so just think about this then. So what I'm going to do as well, have, have any of you, it's a bit of a test for you, uh, seen Charles Jennings' C-curve about the model for, for organisational design? If you haven't, you're going to a couple of times, so that'd be good. Um, Charles has said it's absolutely fine, but if you could send the £10 to him in a plain brown envelope, that'd be good. Uh, so we'll talk through that. So our learning review then, so just think this through. So I started 30 years ago in the group. Uh, I started in TSB, first one, not second one, uh, so the original TSB, then merged with Lloyd's, and when we merged with Lloyd's, we, we've got two training departments, two HR departments, so actually it all got integrated, got centralised, 
Um, we then since, you know, as you've seen, we then did our merger with HBOS, Halifax Bank of Scotland, and guess what we had? Well, we had two HR departments, so all the, all the back office functions, two IT departments. Um, so of course, it was right, really, for a review. All right, so as I say, I've centralized learning six times, been through that six times, and it has some fours and pluses, which hopefully we'll cover off in a moment. So our review of 2010 metrics of learning, this was about running learning as a business, which I think is pretty important, uh, not as a cost center, but as a business. So to how do we support the business? So we had a high ratio of learning colleagues to business colleagues, but we would, wouldn't we? Because all we'd done was taken two different organizations and stuck them together. Uh, feedback reported learning needed aligning with business objectives. And uh, it was quite run as a fiefdom, right? So each division and subdivision of which we had 43 was able to decide their own strategy and they had their own budget. And it, to be quite honest with you, at times some may be going left and the rest of us were going right. Okay, so that was sort of seen as a challenge. Uh, just 42% of available classroom development was utilized. Lots of lost places, uh, lots of no-shows. Uh, technology platform was outdated and a barrier to learning. And I would say this, because I'm the head of learning technology, um, but if you want to go down the route of getting anyone lined up, you sort of need to own one technology platform and get everyone to use the one technology platform. Because if nothing else, you can draw metrics that say, this is where we really are now and know whether you're going right or wrong. Uh, I'm delighted to say, guess how many technology platforms we've got? One, exactly right. Guess how many domains we've got in it? One, we've gone minimalist this time, to be honest. So, uh, and that sort of seems to work. Remember, that's born out of previous experience where we had a number, we had 43 domains and subdomains. Everyone in each subdomain had their own access to the catalog. They put in what they liked. We had, uh, I think we did get to a record of 25 time planning courses. I've got a diary, not sure there are 25 different ways of doing it. Um, and that sort of, it just exploded. So, so it was right for haul it back in. So that's what we did. Um, significant learning spend. Well, we had 25 time planning courses for start. We didn't need 25. Someone was probably maintaining 25 as well. So that wasn't good. So it was right to rationalize. Uh, lots of duplication talked about that. An inconsistent mix of learning channels and even across our divisions was a big inconsistent mix. And it ranged from 90% uh, online in one of our biggest divisions uh, to sort of 1% online in some of the smaller ones. Because okay. the only way to learn in their view was I have to go to a classroom and sit down. So it's partly about how do I make people see that learning is more than turning up at a classroom. So we started that challenge. And we had 1,300 learning supplies, which seemed quite a lot, I think. And so we need to do something about that. So our focus then. So we had an 18-month transformation program. As I say, this is partly an update on that. Then we'll get onto Charles's curve. Um, so what do we want to do? Well, we want to improve learning. Certainly, we wanted to make it more efficient. Right? So that actually for the number of days learning that people received and hours learning, it was considerably less cost. So we, we set out to do that. Um, we wanted to, uh, get the, we wanted to get delivery. So we needed to get the right number of people delivering for the right number of courses when we were well over the norm. Uh, we needed, we transformed the organizational structure. We'll talk more about that when we get to the C curve. Uh, we needed a new technology platform. We did have one. Uh, we had more than one. Uh, but we needed to wrap it around one, and that's what we did. Um, uh, learning content, learning content was pretty traditional, right? So pretty traditional as in we were assessment mad, right? I think in that year we did about three million online assessments, okay? And, and that to us was, well, that sounds good, doesn't it really? So you have to do all your courses, and then you have to do your online assessments. And people grew to hate the technology because they hated doing that, right? So that's sort of association, a bit of psychology, I think. And then, um, we put in academies and capabilities. So one of, the, one, of the, one of the problems, one of the challenges we had was that with so many courses, so many duplicated courses, um, to our fictitious cashier, which we use as our bellwether really, called Nelly from Banbury, we made that up. Uh, we always used to challenge and say, that's great, but what would Nelly really think? And Nelly couldn't find what the learning for her was really. So it was just a huge catalog that you would drive in, go into, there was no role related learning, there was no learning by your division or subdivision or anything. So meta tagging, it sort of wasn't really, uh, because our technology didn't have the functionality to do it. So we addressed that as well. Bing, ah, there it is, first time, there we go. So this is Charles's C curve, right? So if I, uh, so you'll see that, and ignore the arrow, because many people go a different way. Many people decide to stop in the middle and go backwards, uh, most of which is by mistake. So how many have you seen that before? Have you seen that before? 
no, if, if Charles has got a blog, so Charles Jennings Blogspot, I think it is, so you can go on and get that, which he's happy with doing. So, um, and so the, where did we start? Well, the four different boxes, there aren't five, I don't think. We've had loads of us sit and look at this and think, I don't think there are five. Um, is that at this end, look, so if you look at the scales down each side, up that side is strategic alignment, right? So that's strategic as in company strategic, not my own office, yep. So strategic alignment at that side and degree of autonomy, can I do what I like at the bottom? And what you'll notice is that in a decentralized L&D, which is where we sort of were, autonomy was high, because I had my own budget, I could sit in my own office, I could walk out and bark at the trainer sitting outside, so you go and do some training. Um, so that was high, uh, but strategic alignment was really no, because it was me that was setting the strategy. Right? This is sort of standard stuff, not just ours, but this is sort of where we ended up. Uh, so that's decentralised. You can then, and I'm not sure this is a great place to move to, but you can then move to federalised L&D, right? where where you get to is uh, you have less autonomy, because you can impose governance, uh, but still not much strategic alignment. Right? So, because uh, you, you can, uh, you, for example, uh, you would go to federalised L&D by, um, by controlling the budget, by controlling the buildings, by controlling the trainers, but you're not necessarily any more strategically aligned because you haven't got the governance to do it. Okay? So then where people go next is the centralised L&D, uh, and centralised L&D is where, and I've got the, ex the descriptors on the next slide, centralised L&D is that you centralise it and you control govern, you control funding, you control the resource, you pretty much lock it down. Okay? And you need to sort of pass by that to get to the top right-hand box. Like if you don't pass by that, you don't know what you've got, what resource you've got, and we still, I'm sure we still today, have trainers out in the business that are called something else who spend all day their training because someone changed their title to suit, which is fine, and that happens everywhere. Okay? Not, not, not unique to noise in any way. And then I've put a big arrow on that says the desired position, which is aligned autonomy. All right, and what that is, is a mixture of all of those. So what it, what it does is it says, well, uh, we go from where you end up there is that you've got high strategic alignment because you've got good governance. Talk about that in a bit more in a minute. And you've got, but you have a fairly lower, a lower, so you, you have a high degree of uh, autonomy and high strategic alignment. This is the perfect world. Um, and as you do that, of course, the cost of the organization goes down. And it goes down because you don't have 25 time planning causes, if nothing else, because <laughs> you've got it aligned properly. Does that make sense? Okay, have you seen that before now? Good. And um, I'll ask then, so now we sort of went through a descriptive, we'll have a show of hands, look. Uh, how many of you think, if you're in L&D indeed, that you're in a decentralised L&D function where you can do what you like? Okay, you don't be shy, it's really good. You know, so <laughs> I'm not sure there's a right box in here. Uh, how many would you would say are in a federalised L&D? So there's a bit of governance, right, good. How many are in centralised? Ah, that's the spirit, so am I, good. Uh, and how many have got to the wonderful aligned autonomy, if indeed that's a great place? <laughs> good, mate, yeah, good man, yeah, good man. Um, how many have been in more than one box? Worked in more than one box? Yeah, that's good, isn't it, really? So who'd say there's a right one or a wrong one? Because it seems we're all in flux and moving between them, right? And my view is, and I think Charles's was as well, that you move between them because the business moves and you have to respond to that. Okay. And sometimes you move the wrong way. Okay. So next one gives the descriptors. Okay. All these slides, of course, will be online, so you'll be able to have them afterwards. Um, and this can be quite useful, and we've certainly used it when talking to non-L&D people about, look, I think this is our model, and this is maybe where we need to go. This is our strategy. Okay. So we did that. We thought, well, give that a go then. Uh, as I say, we centralised a few times. And our progress. So, where we started, 2010, so it's all right saying all that, but did it have any effect, I think was the answer. Uh, so we started there, uh, so we had 1,000 people involved in learning, and by any measure, that's quite a lot really. Um, uh, six and a half days of training for colleagues, 7,000 courses in our catalogue, uh, 1,300 learning suppliers, 20% as an average was e-learning, that sounds, stop smiling, that sounds interesting. Um, and multiple demand plans and capability frameworks. Everybody owned their own demand. Right? Everybody owned what the most important thing was to do and everybody owned their own, what am I going to spend money on? Yeah. Not the most efficient way to go. So we then did that. So 2012. By 2012, we had 450 people involved in learning. Right? Interestingly, a lot of the people that had been involved in learning went back into business right? and were very useful to the business because they'd learned people skills because that's what trainers tend to be good at. Hello, go on. Could you tell us what you mean by involved? 
so predominant, yeah, predominantly then. So if I say of the 450, about 420 were face-to-face -face trainers. Yeah. Uh, so not quite true. About 400 were face-to-face -face trainers, and the others then were designers. So building the content, maintaining the content. So back office, yeah. But people without whom, without their enabler, you can't do the other bit. Because I'll turn up and I've got a course. You paid their salary. And we paid their salary, yeah. Exactly that, yeah. All of them. And how many learners? How many learners? Yeah, good question. So um, that's varied as well, because the group, uh, as it's amalgamated, but about 100,000. Hmm. Do you want me to name them? I could give it a go. If I... <laughs> no, I don't know, I could do that. Really. <laughs> yeah, so about 100,000. And that keeps moving too. Uh, and, and the mixture, as in any large corporation, of course, is between permanent and then your overflow, which goes into contractors. And, you know, and then you have a different learning need for them because you need them to do management training. So don't fall over any boxes while you're here. Do your health and safety, but not the full suite catalogue. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. OK, so, so we went 7,000 to 2,000 courses in the catalogue. How many people rang and said, I hate you. I really loved that course quite a lot uh, and uh, but we carried on <laughs> because the core content was the same okay remember we got the business involved we got the business involved in rationalizing the catalog okay? uh, because don't forget from all of this it was their profit and loss right so that's how they're measured so we so we helped them to be more efficient I think was a really good way of putting it um, we got to an average of 50% e-learning from 20 and we had one still do have one demand plan and a group-wide capability framework so each, each division and subdivision was also operating on a different capability framework. It makes, um, it makes having a talent pipeline quite tricky when everyone's working on something different. Okay? And you can't divorce the two. So that was one. But interestingly, the one that didn't change was days of training for colleagues. So we still delivered the same amount, the same amount, same amount in hours, same amount in days, but we did it with a lot less resource. Okay, so did we stop there then? No. So that was centralised. And then, bing. so mid-2014, middle of last year, so we're fully transformed, uh, we were fully centralised, uh, we, we implemented, we have been implementing academies and group-wide capabilities, so we've got one version of the truth, uh, we put in new academies, done lots more academies, uh, we carry on rationalising the curriculum, right, because we, we sort of need to, uh, we have new content and delivery approaches and continue with that, we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, we streamline the organisational structure, um, but key, absolutely key in that, in that model is if you're not careful, what you mustn't do is centralise and then lose touch with the business. Okay, because each business does have its own needs. It sounds like I made it a real generic, well, you'll have to do it, and they're really, really different, aren't they? So if you look in our world at corporate versus retail versus finance versus audit, they all have their own individual needs. They have a core base that says, yeah, fine, we'll have that off the stock but they also, also have their own needs. Uh, so what, you, what we did, and we had, to be, you know, we had to be pretty clear with this, is that within each function, they still report on our head count, uh, they're still our own people, we still pay them, are our relationship managers. So we have senior learning partners, we have learning partners, whose job it is to be out there feeding back and saying in the demand plan, so they look after their own demand plan for that bit, then it all comes back in and gets centralised. So the business have a say, why do the business have a say? Because they're paying. <laughs> so the business have a say, but where we can, we use what we can, but we know at any one point exactly what their needs are, so what their big initiatives are going forward, okay, so that we can plan that in. So different way of doing it. Um, and it's underpinned by a new learning technology platform. Well, we got one in the end. How many did we have? Just the one, which sounds pretty good, really, and just with one domain in it as well, which also sounds good, and I'm not sure that's the right answer, but it's not a bad answer, so not the perfect answer. Um, so we have a single access point to all learning. Right? So when anyone comes along and says, I think we ought to do this new learning, the first place they put, they think, the first people they ring generally is me or my team to say, how can we get this in the catalogue? Where should it fit? How can I meta tag it? Where should I link it? Yeah? Which makes it a lot easier for the people on the front line, because if they move around the company, they still only go to one place to find their learning. Okay? And we have a new operating and governance model. A bit more on that. Um, uh, so remember when we looked at Charles's chart, we're going back to it in a minute, uh, our, an, an operating and governance model needs to make sure that we align with the strategy of the company. So we've got a multi-layer approach from mid-2014. So we have a learning council. Learning council has board members on it, so can't get much more senior than that. And they talk through with us what the strategy is, where the, where the company is going, therefore what the focus should be. So we're not left in any doubt. 
Okay, so they do that. That's first level. Second level is a learning governance, uh, sorry, learning governance board at the top. Learning governance council is underneath, and the learning governance council is the senior people in L and D and HR. And then under that we have communities of practice. So we have like-minded people all sort of interacting and talking to each other. Um, and then under that is the people. So we implemented that too. Good. So new learning technology. Look, I'm head of learning technology. We haven't got to technology yet, have we really? So we did launch a new platform. The platform was based on Saba. All right, so we bought Saba. Previous one was based on Docent. Have you heard of Docent? Uh, it wasn't really old, but the instructions were in Latin, I think. It was quite limited. Yeah? So we knew we needed a new platform. Because, of course, in order for the business to use the platform, it has to be credible. So, and it really wasn't quite there. So, uh, so this was our first iteration of Saba. Uh, do you think the people really liked it after the old one? No. And well, that's good, isn't it? <laughs> Come. When you chose Saba, was it strictly learning related or did it touch broader HR capability? Uh, at the time, it was strictly learning related. Yeah, it was then. Yeah, yeah. good question. Good question. Okay. So that was, um, uh, so that's Discover Learning. We called it Discover Learning, my word. How imaginative is that? And that's what it did. The people were, didn't really rave about it. And, and that's probably because we made a few mistakes rather than Saba, because we had some quite good functionality in the old one that we didn't carry forward to the new one. So we had to have a think last year about what do we do with that then. Uh, and so let's go to this, sorry, back to the C curve. Uh, so that was mid-2014, we'll come back to the new view in a minute, that was mid-2014. Uh, where I think we're at in 2015, then as we start this year, is we've moved again. So we're somewhere between centralised L&D and aligned autonomy. Okay? And why we're there is because we gathered the resources together, because we understood it, because we built a good governance model that everyone was brought into, and we have a good governance framework now with the board included, um, we were able, and it seemed to be the right answer, as it says there, to go to local focus, centrally governed. Okay? So it's centrally governed, but our two biggest divisions, retail and operations, uh, now have, they look after their own headcount, but they still are governed by one single point, which is an uh, organisational capability director. Okay? So what they're able to do then, so we've got, the, we've got the people now split out, so that retail, for example, are able to build more subject matter expertise in their business, which adds more value to their business then. Okay? So we grabbed it, and then we've relaxed it back out again. Um, but it still works really well, but it only works really well if you keep a, a tight hand on governance. Right? And in the governance also includes financial as well. Okay, very quickly. So moving with the business, we needed to change again, as I was saying. We had a centralised structure and it increased efficiency, but we need to switch to capability rather than just learning. I don't think we were the only one that woke up to that, I don't think. Uh, we understand and develop the technology platform so we can personalise it to each division. So actually, they can have their own flavour if they want to, but we probably didn't understand that in the first place. Uh, we centralised budget and governance was accepted and working and continues. It, that was quite easy to do, actually, because if you think of the group and its amalgamation, I'm sure you know where we've been through with the, the, the credit crunch and such like, uh, the focus in the whole group was absolutely on cost control. Right? In fact, I think we got to a point about 2009, if you wanted a pencil, well, I couldn't fill out all the forms because I've got a pencil, because <laughs> uh, everything had to go through cost control, which worked. It's worked absolutely, very frustrating at the time, but it's absolutely worked, getting us where we are. So we tagged on the back of that we're learning. And technical training is able to return to local teams to maximise their SME flexibility. Okay. So we rebranded it. And I've often said what a difference a font makes, because remember this is still sitting on the top of the same platform at the back. Um, it is fresher and it's cleaner, but what we've also done, if you like, and this is as a response to feedback, the key bit is across the top. So uh, we have communities in, all right, so a bit of social. We have uh, a bit about your profile, we have a lot about career development, we have a lot about leadership and we keep adding more and more and more. So we have a line manager academy about to roll out all within the same platform. So we don't look for a new one, we just build it so that it will work in here. But remember the people know that if they want to find anything where they go, it's just one place. Right, so that control has been quite important. Okay. Nearly there, I think. So, and then I thought, just to gloat a bit, really, I'd put up 2014 volumes from our learning management system. Remember, these are the volumes, because how many have we got? Well, just the one. <laughs> so we only have to go to one place to find it. Um, so we had 10 million logins to the learning management system last year, which is quite a lot when you've got 100,000 people. Why well, are they doing work? Well, I would say, no. Um, uh, 700,000 completions per month, 
which is a lot, a hell of a lot. Uh, 1.3 million online assessments, down from two, <laughs> but still quite a lot. Uh, and 700 automatic reports. Automatic reports uh, provide business MI. Okay, and is in any uh, really tightly controlled regulatory business a lot of um, a, quite a lot that what was happening was mandatory, around mandatory training stuff you have to do. Uh, but what we've done is stretch that out now to people go there because it's got learning that they want to do, not learning that they have to do. Okay. So mandatory training we changed. We include we increased the pass rate to 100%. That cheered quite a few people up. Um, but we were able to do that because we re-engineered the system so that as you should, you take the test first and it tells you what you don't know. Right? So you don't reread all the modules that you only did a year ago, it tells you which bits of it you need to read. And then you only take the bit of the test again that you didn't pass when you first did it. Right? So the pass rate and competence therefore went up, uh, but it's a hell of a lot quicker to get it done. Okay? Uh, we integrated, and another secret we had was a lot of the links that we have on our LMS are uh, integrated to uh, our own ISP. So we build a lot of things out in our ISP, but when people go, of course, you can do some pretty fancy stuff there that you can't necessarily do in an LMS, but they don't know they've gone anywhere because they've just put it in an iframe. So if anyone wants a supply of smoke and mirrors, I've still got some left over. So, <laughs> but of course, that's sort of web principle. And we've added career paths, business academies to facilitate the move away from mandatory training. What next very quickly? Well, app-based learning would be good. Um, so why, can't, why is it a super tanker we're turning? It's a super tanker because we know what's available, we know maybe where we ought to go next, we know what our strategy should be, and predominantly we still run on IE6, okay, which is a limiting factor, but, but that is being replaced, and as that happens, of course, we'll tag on the back of that. So app-based learning would be great, because we're getting into the modern world, and finally, going social, which is taking up a lot of our conversations now. So in Charles's 70-20-10 model, uh, of course, we said we'll follow the 70-20-10 model and then we launch a platform that predominantly covers the 10. <laughs> okay? uh, and we know we need to do something different. We know we want our people to collaborate. The group knows that. They've made it part of their strategic review. And I think this captures it quite well. We've done a few. We're done doing a pilot at the moment for 1,000 people. We've not done the pilot to test the tool is the right one. We've done the pilot to <coughs> test more around the culture and will people collaborate. But it's not necessarily about the technology. Okay. Uh, and a really great phrase on there. So 99 one, have you heard of that? Uh, and that's the bit we're trying to shift. So that was our benchmark for when we started out with a, a bit of a social pilot. Um, so the one is, so out of every 100 people that go on your social platform, there's an average, it's only an average, uh, that one person will post something. Picture, video, and the one we're using, you're allowed to, you can do videos off your iPhone, great stuff. Um, so one person will post something, um, nine people will comment on it, and 90 people will read it and do nothing. Right? That's not really collaboration, is it? <laughs> However, if you can join the one up with the other 99, it's better than nil. Okay? Because they may teach something insightful. So, and we are actually beating that at the moment, but it's hard work to beat it. It's back to a cultural thing. You have to have good moderation. You have to keep it fresh, keep it changed. And that then, and that might be, this might be a really good link, I think, uh, that then starts to get you to think about so all of those structure pieces, are they the right ones for the future if you move to that? And the answer is, well, maybe not, because maybe what you need is more facilitation, not delivery. Okay. So that was a good link, wasn't it, Nigel? Sure um, and the other phrase I'll just steal off there, which someone christened the other day, is that one of the challenges with social, we think, uh, is that we're asking people to work out loud. Okay. So it's quite interesting when someone posts a problem that you might ask the person next door to you and say, what do you think? And, and so I think we should do this. Or you say, well, I think we should do this. I think, no, no, you've only got one person that you've exposed your lack of knowledge to. When you expose it to 100,000, that takes quite a cultural thing and a, quite a lot of trust in order to do it. Okay? And that's our next worry B, but we'll worry about that this year. Okay. I think that's probably me. Any questions? Yes? Yeah. Six point five days. Yeah. Yeah. Is much like you learning going on outside the workplace? No, it isn't, no. No, it isn't, no. So most of that 6.5 isn't happening outside. It, it doesn't happen outside the workplace. All of our learning is accessible, except face to face. All of the online learning is accessible outside the workplace. So it's all accessible from World Wide Web. It has been for about 10 years. So. But does that mean, sorry? Okay, no problem. Yeah. 
No, they're not. No, they're not, no. no. It's available, but they don't necessarily do it in their own time. But it is available if they should want. And we're very keen not to force that because, you know, they have time allotted for learning within their, within their time. Anyway, sorry, lots of questions. Good. We'll go for the man on the front, and we'll come back to you there. Yeah. Do you cast your mind back out at the beginning of your involvement? Yeah. What's perhaps the most painful memory? If you could share with us about what you got wrong, what would that be? Oh, that's a really good question. So. Yeah. Oh, we got nothing wrong because we are perfect. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you learn by your mistakes, not by your successes, don't you? So, um, the big piece that I'd say to people don't go there was one of the mistakes I think we made was. Uh, we centralised design, right? So we took design from each individual function with all its SMEs and we centralised it. And then we wrapped all of the designers together and we ran a model that said, for efficiency we thought we ran a model that said our internal designers would maintain what we have and anything that we required new we'd buy in, right? And a lot of that involved in the end bringing in contractors <laughs> to build it instead of our own people building it and that actually Contractors buy their, not being rude to them, but have, where's the skin in the game, I think? And where's their deep SME? And we had a lot of challenges with technology for them to get onto bank systems, for example, to do uh, simulations. It was a nightmare. It could take, you know, on a, on a 10 week contract, it could take you three weeks to get them a laptop that worked. <laughs> and you might say, oh, you should have thought of that. And you know what? You're right. <laughs> uh, so that was a big bit of learning, really. And we've hauled back from that slightly. So now that we've semi devolved again, so the retail division have their own design function. Uh, I have a design function. Well, the group learning has a design function, and then group operations has one. But they're all part of the same community of practice. And funny enough, they're all on our social pilot to exchange ideas. So, so come on. Yeah, lady over the learning council. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> executive group, uh, say, was Tesco. Uh, Uh, so I'll have to make it up for them because I'm not one of them. But I think my view would be they would say and do sort of say that at least now they've got visibility of what goes on. A lot of what went on before was happening well under their radar. Right? So, so in, in effect, a lot of the spend on learning was down here and they were running a business up here. So it didn't get any visibility with them, but now it's brought to their table. And um, the other thing I think that I hope they would say was a success. You know, a great example of lot, we've been through a few regulatory changes, you might have spotted that really, uh, is that they arrive in there first, right, and then that's cascaded down so they can be assured that, you know, they're not the one who's going to get the regulator breathing down their neck because it's able to go in. So they would say it's been a really good route to ensure that whatever comes in gets dealt with. Makes sense. Uh, how long have we got? Um, Probably time for just one more question. Okay. We have got a little bit at the end, no, but right. you, okay. you raised so, your hand a few minutes ago, so please. Warren just said 30 minutes ago. Just wondering about the and how you went about measuring the impact on business. Yeah. So a lot of numbers, but not a lot of yeah, so good point. So, really good point. So, so uh, again, a game of two halves, that one, I think. Um, so, the, in assessment terms, what the business really wanted to know and wanted to report on, and we're reporting mad because we're regulated. Uh, the wanted to know and wanted to report on was have you gained the confidence? Not has it made a difference. Okay. Because actually the real metric, first metric is can we prove when asked mm. you've actually acquired that knowledge? And acquiring that knowledge in a traditional way, which is still in some way what we do, meant I can take all these and pass all the questions. Right? We need to move from that because it needs to be about application and not about just a straight knowledge journey. But we are perfect. Mm -hmm. Can I just sure. about the role yeah. the hey, go on. What role do you have your the line managers play in that? Because for us, one of the things around observed confidence change and behaviour change comes from the line manager rather than it does. any other test. So what yeah. role do line managers play in that? Well, the line managers have to do them too. Okay, so they, they, are, they are sort of bought into it, uh, but they also have within their objectives that, the people, that their people need to prove their competence. So the, the line manager is very much a role of, you haven't done this yet, why haven't you done it? So it's a, it's a chaser, actually, more than anything else, but they equally have to do that. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank Gary you very much.